Hello and welcome along to episode four of Electric Sheep. We'll subtitle this one A New Hope. And my name is Paul Andrews and I'm joined in the studio by Carl Sykes. Hello once again. And Lindsay Muir. Hello. And our very special guest this week is Lloyd Williams. <laughs> Lloyd is the head of Newport University's careers department. Um, so we're going to be chatting to Lloyd a little bit later on about how he and his department use technology A to function as a department, but also looking at some things uh, that students might be able to do to enhance their career prospects, their employability prospects as well. But before we get into that, uh, we'll do our usual kind of weekly roundup of what everyone's been doing. So um, I'll start off, as I always do, uh, with Carl. Carl, what have you been doing this week? Thank you very much. Uh, apart from uh, a couple of days off in Ireland, which has been absolutely fantastic and thoroughly enjoyable. Who Hello. gave you time off? <laughs> which crazy person? <laughs> Shocking. Yeah, yes, no, we won't go into that one. Uh, yeah, but it's been a very nice time. But what I've been doing since I've been back is working with um, some staff members who've come to me and asked if I can give them some information about blogging, um, how they can use a blog, how they can create their own blogs, and, and, and generally why you'd want to set up your own, your own blog account. So we've looked at a couple of options. Options, um, to name a few, Tumblr and Blogger, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners out there uh, are aware of those, mm -hmm. but if not, we will put the links to both of those up on the Electric Sheep site yeah. at some point, so you can refer back to them. Um, but we've, we've looked at the reasons why you might set up a blog and the types of information you might want to get out to, um, to people in the big wide world. Um, you might want to use it as a way to uh, just kind of give some information about yourself, who you are and what you do. It might be a personal blog about a particular thing that interests you. But of course, you might want to use it for academic reasons. Perhaps you do a lot of research or perhaps you um, work on a lot of publications. And it's a good way to get the information out there about the publications that you do uh, to link to those publications, maybe include some videos um, or, or audio information about the, the work that you're doing. Um, and it's a brilliant way of taking all that information, placing it in one nice, easy to manage place and kind of spreading the message to people about um, all the good stuff that you're doing. So, so yeah, so, we, so we've had a little look at blogs and um, we've had a look at as I say, how we can use them. Um, and what we're probably going to do over the next week or so is sit down and actually look to create these blogs, get some information up there, get some um, videos, text, audio files, and start to put together a package that staff can make use of and, and kind of sell all the good stuff that they're up to at the university. So we're talking about staff making blogs. Are they then going to show students how to make blogs as well, or is it...? Yeah, absolutely. That's the hope. The hope is that once we've trained staff up to actually get to grips with, with this software, they'll be able to kind of take it away, um, run sessions for their students, and kind of run with the creation of, of those blogs for their students. Now, you know, maybe a blog isn't for everybody out there, but certainly I know it's uh, a lot of students either have their own blogs or are interested in creating their own blogs for their own personal interests. So, yes, in, in answer to your question, the hope is that staff will will take what they've learned and and teach that 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 information to students to allow them to start to express themselves through the power of blogging brilliant it just reminds me of something we've done with um we at, at university of wales newport we have a, a really really great student mentor scheme and um a couple of months ago we taught the student mentors how to use a blogger um, you know, so they could write. The idea was they were going to write reflective blogs, and it was almost like to keep a reflective journal. And we said to them, "Look, you've got the choice. You can either make this thing private, so only you see it, and perhaps you know named people that you want to see it, and perhaps the, you know, the student mentor manager, or if you want to, you can go out and make it public." And that over the last week or so, what some of them have started to do now, they've actually um, graduated, if you like, from doing text blogs to doing video blogs. Um, and I, I'm going to put a link to this on, on the website, but uh, they've actually started to do a question and answer session on YouTube and actually then and putting the video on their blog. So they basically have all of the questions that they as student mentors get asked by the students that they support. Uh, but because they're common questions, they've said, right, we're going to put all these in a video. And we're going to answer them on the video. So, student, so anyone can look at this on their you know games console, mobile phone, computer whatever you want but get the answers to those common questions in a more human way yeah absolutely uh, that's that's fantastic i mean sometimes you know you know a blog is a great thing but sometimes a big chunk of wordy text is not really the response that you want so so having the option to be able to kind of you know you're not there in the room with somebody but essentially you're getting a a, a human answer um mm. it's a fantastic thing for students to get so that's that's great yeah, it's really good we'll, we'll put a link to it underneath underneath this podcast because it's 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 a lovely model and i'm really 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 pleased that they've done it because they've done it off their own initiative we just kind of pointed them in the right direction and they've they have run with it it's it's, it's fantastic superb <laughs> Lindsay, 
Hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. What have you been doing this week? Um, this week I've been running some training sessions for visiting lecturers here at the University of Wales right. um, in the Humanities Department. Um, they've been having some training sessions on Moodle, which is our virtual learning platform, yep. and basically doing them as a webinar because oh, right. they're based all around the country. There was mm. one from Liverpool, one from the Cotswolds. Um, so it's a way um, to be able to train people without them physically having to come in for the training session. Gotcha. So um, what are you using for the web? How's that working? What technologies are you using? Is it, is it the case that they sit at a computer and they can they hear you? Can they see you? Can they, what, what, do they, what do they see if they sit down and do this webinar? Well, one of the sessions that we did, a number of lecturers come together in one room and yeah. they can okay. watch it on a screen. Right. Um, and then the other option is that, that, that people can log in and view it wherever they are individually. Right, okay. So yeah, there's yeah. two different ways that you can do it, basically. Cool. Um, w personally, I was using a mixture of Skype and Join Me. And um, basically, yeah, they can hear and see what you're doing on the screen. Right. They can see your mi mouse moving and see whatever you're looking at gotcha. and hear your voice over the top. So, 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 so Skype lets them hear you. What's Join Me then? What does that What does that do? Join Me allows you to share your screen right, with okay. multiple users. Brilliant. Because you can share your screen in Skype, but unless you've got a, a premium account, you can only share your screen with one person. I see. So Join Me uh, allows you to do it with a number of people. All oh, right. So it, so it takes what you're viewing on screen and almost puts it as like a like some kind of like a video almost, but and then anyone can yeah, watch it. Yeah, it's like a live video. It's, right. it's watching live what you do. It's a nice amalgamation of, of kind of two two bits of software that, that otherwise would tie you into having to pay for something. Mm. Essentially, it's, you know, want a bit of a description, it's kind of circumnavigating the, the little um, problems you have with those bits of software and actually combining two together to, the to create, place. yeah, absolutely, to mm. create a, a resolution. So that, that's great. Mm. Wow. Yeah, so um, it basically allows you to do exactly what you do in a training room. It's no different. Mm. So they get the, you know, the sound of your voice and get to watch whatever's on the big screen. But as I said, because they're stopped spotted all around the country um it just saves them having to come in and physically do the training here at the university so right. yeah and what kind of kit do you need i mean let's say someone's listening to this and they're thinking oh, I, I quite like to have a go at that um you know skype i mean we, we've mentioned it a previous podcast that's free join me is, free. that's free as well yeah so is there anything else they would need other than to go to these websites and get the get the actual software is there anything else they'd need perhaps um, well, if you want to deliver a webinar, then right. you'd need a headset so okay. that you can, uh, you know, project your voice. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're listening to the webinar, then you need speakers to be able to hear the voice. But apart from that, you just need the basic setup, whether it's a laptop or a PC. Gotcha. Um, so it's just a microphone and speakers, basically. Right. And uh, yeah, the software is free. And were the, the, the folks who were watching the webinar, did they have... Did they need any support in the room with them there, or were they... Well, do you know, I said there was two different ways. Mm. So the one way where you can get a number of lecturers in a room together. Right, okay. Um, then you might, they might need a bit of IT support there to to get the software up and running on the big screen. Oh, so they were kind of watching it on the... Almost like a big telly, if you like. Yeah, like a, oh, yeah. okay. An example of that is um, our community learning mm -hmm. up in Tredega. Um, to save all the Tredega lecturers coming down to the Killian, yep. then they all get together in the training suite up there and watch it that way. Oh, right, okay. Um, and like I said, the other way, where people are watching from their own homes, mm. um, they don't need anything different than just their basic kit. Wow. Really so no, good. no technical support at all. That's fantastic. Um, also on Skype then, you, there's a chat function in there as well. So um, if someone wanted to ask a question but didn't want to speak mm. out over the webinar, then they could ask the question in that way, you know, type it up and I could answer it in that way. Right. So, yeah, so if, if they maybe like, don't have the confidence or whatever it might be to actually get on the microphone, they can just type something. Or... Yeah. That's quite good, actually, because I know a lot of people, um, when you do kind of real-time voice chat one of the complaints is and certainly a lot of the research says that, that it, it reduces the amount of time that people have for reflection and mm. for some people not for everybody but for some people having that space to think a little bit before you come out with a response is quite valuable yeah so i suppose in that way it kind of caters for those individuals who just want to kind of get on there and have a chit chat but other people who do want to hang back but then want to get their opinion across but don't necessarily want to say it so yes. they can just type it in, uh, you know exactly yeah the lovely thing is that you can record the webinars as well, right. so um, people could watch them later. So the people that actually join in the webinar could watch it again later if they wanted to, or people who didn't have a chance to join in, in the real live time, um, they could watch it later too. 
that's pretty cool. Yeah, you, you you mentioned rec recording. Is there anything specific? I know there's lots of stuff out there, but I mean, if you had to pick something that that you use to record uh, your your webinar sessions, is there something you can kind of put out there to the listeners? Well, the the main piece of software I use is something called Jing, um, which mm -hmm. is a screencast tool. Um, that's free, um, and that's just what we use in work basically. But like you said, there are a number of different options, mm. free ones as well. Yeah. And the, I mean, the the thing I like about the, the solution you've come up with with the Skype and Join Me is that there are free mobile apps that work with this stuff as well. So it means people can actually watch and participate in these webinars if they've got a smartphone. Exactly. They can stand at a bus stop and do it. They don't need to be sat at in a computer. a computer room or at a computer. It works on everything. Yeah, 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 absolutely, and not not tying somebody down to a fixed desk is you know is a godsend really because mm. you know we're all we're all busy people and uh, we're all constantly on the go. So having that option to to kind of carry your your, your webinar around with you on a smartphone is a is a really useful uh, accessory. This week I was lucky enough um, to be invited to the Welsh Assembly, uh, which is down in Cardiff Bay, which is all very nice and lovely. And I went down there because they were having a seminar on the future of uh, teaching ICT, information communication technology, in the Welsh education sector. And the gist of it basically was, and I, I am paraphrasing here, that um, at the moment there is a, a feeling uh, that the current curriculum isn't necessarily equipping students with the necessary skills they need to, and this is quite pertinent because we've got Lloyd here, uh, with the necessary skills they need should they choose to enter kind of um, IT-related jobs, uh, because what they are saying is that the, the current um, I, ICT GCSE, uh, and again I'm paraphrasing, uh, teaches students how to use pieces of software, mm -hmm. uh, so it, you know, it, it gives them valuable skills on how you use it, Microsoft Word, Excel, that kind of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily teach them how to code. And so what they were saying is that the, there is a, a, a growing demand uh, for people with the ability to be able to program and also break problems down that they can then program mm. so that it can enter growing industries such as the video games industry but also kind of commercial business software applications as well. So they, they basically had a lot of uh, industry leaders there and me. <laughs> I was a very, very small fish in a very, very large pond. Um, but uh, talking about what, you know, what could be done there. And it was the, the conversation. I met some amazing people. It, it was a really, really great exercise. Um, uh, not only for a thought exercise, but it was just lovely to meet kind of people who are all sorts of different, uh, different fields of mm. expertise. So there are people there from British Telecom. There, there were people there from all the major universities. Uh, they had schools leaders, uh, headmasters, all that kind of stuff basically uh, just saying what they thought and what should be done um, and so ideas were uh, discussed about possible new qualifications possible rebranding um, and also the need uh, when people say ICT at the moment it's used as a catch-all for so many things mm, that people yeah. don't know what it is so they were saying actually we need to kind of name the specific things such as the teaching of computer science is different very different to maybe office skills, mm. which is different again to, uh, you know, how do you enhance teaching and learning through technology and all of these things are called ICT. And so there's a great deal of confusion. And so what um, Leighton Andrews, uh, the education minister for Wales, was, is trying to do is um, basically clear all the confusion up and produce a qualification that will give students the opportunity to engage in those areas of employment if they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they do want to specialise and say, right, I want to go into the games industry, there is a clear path to do so. The, the thing that came out uh, really was they were trying to identify what the constants were. And one that came out was this idea of critical thinking. Um, the idea is you take a problem, whatever that problem might be, and break it down into manageable chunks, which can then be uh, solved by programming or emulated by programming. But they, what they were actually saying was that that skill even if you don't result in programming some stuff, is actually a valuable skill to have in yeah. all walks of life. Mm -hmm. So so there was a there was a, a I think I think it would be fair to say that everyone in the room was passionately agreeing with one another, if that makes any sense. So there was a lot of kind of people really enthusiastic and, and energized, but I don't I I didn't hear anyone in the room kind of saying this is a bad idea. Everyone seemed to recognise that there was a real need for this. 
and also that the, um, I mean, they were in praise of kind of the Welsh education uh, sector in general, because what they were saying is that Wales as a country is small enough and agile enough to be able to make these changes. So um, I found it really, really useful. I, and I, was, I, I, I kind of sat in the room thinking, I'm so glad I'm here. This is really, really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'll be really keen to see what comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, but I know the Welsh Education Minister is, he's on, he, he's on top of this one. He does want to do something. So Excellent. we shall see. Um, so, yeah. And it kind of, it, kind of, it was, it was a timely thing. There was an article this week, and again, we'll put a link to it up, um, on IGN, um, which is a, a website essentially about the video games industry. But there was a, a comment about from a, a BAFTA award winner. He's a, a television producer. Um, and he was saying that at the moment there is a lost generation of British talent because specifically in the kind of the digital entertainment industry because these skills that people have these skills but it's almost uh considered to be like a hobby mm. and it's not recognized as part of the national curriculum so I'll, I'll put a link up to the article so you can kind of have a have a, a read through it if you are interested <laughs> um so yeah so that was so that was my my kind of experience this week but it was i mean i was very very grateful that the Welsh education minister held the event and i was incredibly grateful to be invited and privileged as well to be able to represent the university. So, um, yeah, good. Good Excellent. stuff, yeah. OK, so now it's time for us to have uh, a bit of a chat with our very special guest this week, who is Lloyd Williams, who is the head of our careers and employability service at the University of Wales Newport. So, Lloyd, thank you very much for being here today. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, so I think we we'll start off for those people who, uh, again, aren't aren't aware of um, what your department does. Could you provide a, a brief description to people explaining what the Careers and Employability Service is all about, really? Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, in, in the most simpler sense, um, a student arrives at uh, the university with um, uh, one set of skills and one set of motivations and ambitions. And I guess in the most simplest of terms, we want them to leave better equipped to um, achieve what they want to do in their life, in their career, uh, than when they first started. So they're, they're here for a three-year or four-year or sometimes longer journey, mm. um, and it's about us supporting them in every way we can uh, during that time. It may be through very simple stuff like uh, providing one-to-one -one information. It may be about working with them uh, either inside their curriculum as part of their course, uh, if they do professional skills modules, maybe about working with them outside of their course through various workshops and seminars we put on. Um, or it may be through the various events that we put on during uh, the course of the time that they're here. We bring employers onto campus and so forth. Um, equally, uh, we realise that a lot of students are pretty busy. Uh, yep. They don't have time to come and engage with us in person. And maybe this is where we'll uh, talk more about the technological kind of stuff, because a lot of what we do now, you know, there's uh, many thousands of students in yeah. Newport, and uh, they're not all going to get the chance to sit down with a careers advisor. No. And uh, if they did, we may be struggling a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. um, a lot of our information, advice, guidance uh, is now uh, very much delivered through uh, the medium of technology. Well, so so I guess you're offering a almost like a a, a mixed bag of, of service students. You say to them, look, if you want to come and get face to face help, you can do. But actually, there's a there's a website on there. Yeah. I mean, we'll we'll put the link to the website up onto the blog anyway. And um, what kind of things have you got on on the website? Um, in terms of um, information, which is you know primarily what the website's about, mm. uh, about um, clearly it's directing them to events and uh, workshops and seminars and so forth right. that we, we put on, um, but also a lot of um, uh, information on future career choices, uh, how to put a CV together, where to find information on particular occupations. Um, but we, we try to take it a bit further than that, even uh, by linking in with um, outside organisations uh, and bringing them on, uh, linking them onto our website. Uh, organisations who may undertake psychometric tests, so students right. can get to uh, get get some sort of sense of who am I, uh, what 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 am I, what am I good at, what are my skills. Um, they would include um, organisations such as Target Jobs, mm -hmm. uh, Prospects, these types of uh, organisations. Uh, equally, we have links with recruitment organisations and employers. Mm. One that we have a, a very strong partnership with at the moment is called Meet the Real Me, which right. is um, a video CV based organisation wow. okay. where um, uh, they obviously encourage uh, students to uh, record some short little clips uh, mm -hmm. about uh, what they're good at, uh, what, what they've achieved, etc., etc. Yeah. And that now forms part of their recruitment process. And um, we've um, we've developed that link over a couple of years. Uh, still trying to encourage students to uh, to, to take the plunge. Yeah, uh, is, but can is, be quite is, daunting. Is, yeah, is is the big thing. But yeah. um, you know, we try to uh, sort of going back to the point about the website. We try to use the website as a sort of platform to launch people into into a variety of different um, kind of tasks and and. Uh, 
uh, sort of assistance that is going to is going to improve their future prospects. Right. I say, as I said, we'll put a link to the website up anyway. So, um, is it is the website very much kind of a, like a an information portal? Is there an opportunity for students to ask questions via the website, or is it more a yeah, um, we um, have a, a have a relationship with an organisation called Prospects, right. um, which uh, supports a number of higher education career services, mm-hmm. and um, through them we get some software that kind of sits behind our website. That's mm-hmm. as technical as I'm going to get. That's right, it's fine. Yeah, um, it's, it's and, behind works for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that that does one or two things. Yeah. Um, it, um, it it allows us to run an appointment system, which mm-hmm. is fairly fairly straightforward. But uh, for, for students to book appointments for face to face advice, mm. they can do that online. That's really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know they're, 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 having us in one kind of place now just doesn't work around the lives of students and sure, they're, they're sure. busy busy people um we can obviously promote the events and uh and things like that via, via via that service but yes there is also um a bespoke what we call e-guidance uh, service right. uh, that uh, th- that we we have uh, been donated we're given it via oh. this prospect service mm. uh, where um uh, you know anybody can send an email with advice and guidance and they can still do that to be fair but sure. um this actually kind of tailors their questions are you going to ask about this are you going to ask about that oh, okay. could you give us information about this could you give us information about that so it kind of helps your average kind of careers advisor from just getting this kind of random email yeah. uh, about saying what can i do next yes. which you know we think well come in and see us then because Absolutely. we can't respond to that by yes. our email but it sort of helps them kind of tailor their their questions so that right. uh, in many cases we can then give them something very specific. We do still get a what can we do next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. In from time to time, yeah. um, and um, various kind of things are thrown around the room at that stage. But um, <laughs> no, it's um, it's 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 a useful, uh, as I said, bespoke e guidance service. That's so. brilliant. And you find that. Um... Are many people making use of it? Uh, is it well? Or is it growing, or is it? it it's kind of stabilised. It's, it's strange, really. Um, mm. and it may be that we we need to give it some extra airtime because we probably get somewhere in the region of about 120, 150 queries that way each year, okay. or specific kind of queries, which actually isn't an enormous amount. Mm. Um, because I look after kind of what I call the generic email requests mm-hmm. that just kind of arrive into the kind of career yeah. service inbox, and we probably get more still that way. Gotcha. Um, but I would love to encourage those ones to be uh, using this kind of format more. As much as anything else, we can monitor it then much yeah. more. It gives us, you know, management information, statistics and things like that. But as I said, it's it's better for the user because they can uh, be somewhat guided uh, mm. before they even kind of put the question in front of us. That sounds really good. That's fantastic. So, I mean, in terms of, obviously, I mean, there's, there's two things when you talk about technology. There's, there's two main things, um, really, I think, that are worth exploring. The first one is kind of how... You, how you or your team might use technology. And then the second one is what technology students uh, might want to use to increase their employability. So if we go for kind of the former uh, first, is there anything um, that you yourself use or with your team, any tools or technologies that you use to essentially make your life easier in running that, in running your department, doing all the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the list is quite quite long, actually. And I mean, I'm I'm very proud of my my team in Mm. the sense how they embrace technology. And I like to think that the Careers and Employability Service at Newport does have a very positive uh, relationship with technology. And they're also very highly regarded I'll go, I'll go on air and saying that's very highly regarded so. yeah, a bit of mutual backslapping <laughs> going, going on there. Um, yeah so uh, I, I, I'll almost kind of run round the different some of the different kind of functions rather than mm. individuals the functions of the team and where I feel technology is, uh, is, sure. is, is, is used starting firstly with um, kind of professional engagement mm-hmm. with our peers and by peers obviously I mean other career specialists yeah. uh, 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 across the piece really and um, I certainly know that from my perspective and one or two of my colleagues use Twitter now um, mm. and LinkedIn yep. uh, as as key tools to communicate uh, both what we're doing to, to share good practice with others mm. and, uh, and and generally you know, you, you get a bit of self-promotion mm. on the back of that and, mm. and, I don't, and I don't mean that in any kind of arrogant or kind no, of, no. Uh, kind of sort of negative way it's it's just a sort of you know people start to sort of recognize what you're good at yeah. and people make from time to time come to you and say i see you've done this you know because you've been talking about mm. it could be something as simple or not simple but something as uh, as, uh, as as like a, we recently undertook a, a quality uh, award within within the department and letting other people know of the trials and tribulations as we as we prepared and, and yeah. went through that process um as much as uh, giving us the chance to sort of uh, let off a bit of steam allowed others to sort of come and, and talk to us later so mm. so that was good um over over the course of time though you know um a bit of you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Comes out through through any sort of social network, sure. and you know you know the experts of, of, who've been through it themselves mm. in certain areas, and vice versa. So 
I think we have a very strong profile of the Newport Careers team generally mm. because of uh, our, our individual profiles across um, social media, mm. and professional media. Um, thinking a, a little bit more broadly, um, and possibly still sticking to social media, when we run our larger events throughout the course of the year, uh, the large employer events, when we um, uh, put on large kind of student bit focused events uh, where, where we may look at recruitment and so forth. Mm -hmm. We've started using a lot more now tw Twitter and social media as part of the, the pre-event marketing. So right. letting people know uh, that it's going on. And, you know, we'd be fools not to realize that students know Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, well, less LinkedIn, actually, but mm. certainly Facebook and Twitter, you know, uh, that gets the message across to them um, as much, if not more so than clearly the old fashioned sticking a few posters around the place or yeah. even yeah, the yeah. more new fashioned send a few texts or um, send or put something on the MLE. I mm. think, you know, moving to the platforms that they're actually uh, engaging with is, has proved, I hope, um, to be a, a viable option. But then during the events themselves, um, we, we, we want we want a lot of footfall you know sure. we're quite equally happy if people are engaging with us virtually so to speak right. so if we have hashtags and so forth associated with event or in the uh, we haven't quite got to live stream in our events okay. yet but that you know, maybe some some mm -hmm. some way down the path what we have done in a recent event is we've recorded it uh, mm. on uh, we've employed a couple of students uh, filmmakers to record the event um, to sort of raise the profile of i think it was work experience in that case uh, right. and now we're going to embed that video on on our on our site so um, oh, brilliant again these these kinds of tools mm. are providing information through not just words but through images through videos and things like that is, mm. is, is, is all part actually, of actually i've seen that video and it's excellent mm. we'll put and, that on there. We'll and what it. i love about it as well is that it was it was made by two students mm. here at yeah. the university yeah, and we they feel, were really good <laughs> they were we feel we feel that, that we came full circle in that regard because the, the event was about work experience and encouraging students to take work experience mm. and they, the out, one of the outputs of that event was having a couple of students to undertake mm. some work experience themselves yeah, so, that's brilliant um, mm. yeah um, um do you find that um i mean the one thing I like about certainly Twitter and Facebook is that it humanizes people like departments. So rather than it being, you know, the careers department, mm. it becomes, oh, it's it's Lloyd mm. or it's, you know, you've got other like Sally or Jing or other, other people that are working. Do you find that happens with the students or do they still? Oh, that's a tricky one, Paul, actually, because mm. I'd like to think that would be an end goal. Mm. Um, but as it stands at the moment, the the general interaction through social media is under the name kind of Newport Careers. Right, so, okay. Uh, now, Newport Careers, it, it might have my face on it, but some people are, are engaging <laughs> sure. with it. Uh, probably for many people, one would hope not, but um, <laughs> for, 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 for others, it, it's whoever they've been yeah. dealing with. So I, 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 I think it humanises it to an extent, but I don't know if you'd end, they'd end up associating it with a particular individual when right. they talk to Twitter or, or mm -hmm. whatever, because they, they could be dealing with, with anybody. Um, so... Yes and no. I yeah. Think. So you so you've got like a, a careers presence plus individual. Yeah, that, that, that's the key. I think isn't it? I mean, it. and you know the careers the careers account is our kind of engagement with students, mm -hmm. and the individual accounts are possibly our own professional networks. Right. Um, that's okay. maybe how I how I would yeah. differentiate the two. Yeah. Um, and both work effectively with 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 different audiences. I yeah. would say. And do you find that helps? I mean, certainly engaging with other professionals in, in terms of your own or your your team's own kind of. CPD, their continuous professional development. Is it a case of people saying, "Oh well, I'm I'm working in a careers department in another university, and I've tried this. This really works Absolutely. really well. Here, have this. Try this. That kind of thing." Absolutely. I mean, you know, there's that kind of sharing um, that that we all have to buy into now for our own professional mm. development. A lot of our professional development doesn't have to be formal training courses anymore. It is just about sharing information um, through through social media and whilst well, we're saying that the individual and the departments are different, I would like to say that if if an individual has got a very strong professional profile on mm -hmm. social media, their department, even their, their, their institution, can only benefit from, from yeah. that because it's, it's actually promoting all three. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I would say that the, the, all three are promoted yeah. well through my, my yeah. team. It's almost like having star players. I mean, I'm, I'm not a football person. Carl's the football person. But it's almost like having, a, having a, a star player for a football team. You might go, well, I know that, that star player, but I associate that quality with that particular team. Yeah, and, yeah. You know. I hope so. Yeah, I like that. I like that analogy. I am a football person, but um, and I still like that analogy. So that's, that's, yeah. Excellent. So, um, so we talked about how you're using technology to kind of uh, obviously uh, promote the work that you do and uh, reach out uh, to people and engage them. Um, is there anything, any other tools that you use within the department uh, that help you do kind of general day-to-day -day things 
that make life a little bit easier? Yeah, I mean, I won't bore people with all the usual administrative mm. stuff, but mm-hmm. you know, you've got your emails and uh, yeah. and so forth, and databases mm-hmm. and, and and things like that. Um, one of one of my colleagues, uh, I think, could, has, has, to, has had to create a bespoke database to gather information on all of the leavers of the university, because that's another thing that the department does. Once uh, right. once uh, people leave uh, Newport University, we're probably one of the few parts of the university that remain in in contact with them mm. for two reasons. Um, one. Well, because we want to, of um, course. because we, we <laughs> this this guarantee about getting you know ensuring that they they they're embarking on a successful and uh, positive kind of uh, career mm. uh, is one that we are happy to to pursue with them after they leave us, mm. and that's almost part of our kind of ethical responsibility. Sure. But also because we have to, um, <laughs> and um, uh, one of the uh, one of the things we have to do six months after students leave uh, Newport uh, University is uh, give them a call right. and um, find out what they're doing to mm-hmm. see whether uh, it's. Uh, what they want to be doing. Do you um, really? All levers? Yeah. That's yeah. pretty wow. impressive. And I mean, I suppose you could say technology does play quite a big part in that. Mm, um, yeah. You know, at this stage now, because uh, we're, we're kind of just beginning the process from those who left in June. Um, right. And so the first kind of point of contact is an email. Mm-hmm. Um, but even prior to that, uh, my, my colleague uh, Sharon, who, who kind of organises this process, will have been putting messages out on Facebook, Twitter, kind of softening people up. Sure. Like saying, there's about to become a questionnaire, come, come right. your way. Um, you know, be prepared and, you know, please, you like us, kind yeah. of give us the information sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we rely on, on, on that to an extent, although I have to say, um, to get the bulk of the data, we still have to go back to good old fashioned picking up a phone, ringing people up yeah. and, uh, and asking them what they're, what they're doing. Mm. Um, I don't, I haven't found that technology has been quite so useful mm. uh, in, in, in terms of the getting the information. Where it has been quite useful, though, um, again, is that, because we maintain, we have that relationship with, with students when they're at university, say by, particularly via Facebook, I would, yeah. I would suggest, they don't just cut us off when they leave. So mm. when, uh, when we're out there trying to find out what they're doing at the moment, people kind of tell you a lot about what they're doing mm. on Facebook, and mm. particularly if they've yeah. been successful and so forth. And uh, uh, we can certainly get information that way. We still have to then communicate and contact with them because it's up to them to give us that information directly. But um, we get a lot of, what should we say, warm leads um, yeah. through, through, through Facebook, and uh, yeah, Facebook in particular. So yeah. it does feature as part of that. Um, but also, um, just to go back to what I said at the beginning, all of this data then has to be recorded somewhere, and uh, we're back to our old friends' kind of access databases right. and what not to do to do that. That's fantastic. I mean, it certainly sounds like um, social media and, and professional media plays a huge part in, you know, in some way or another in a, in lots and lots of aspects of, of what you do. Um, I wanted to just kind of go back very quickly because I'm pretty certain most people will have heard of Facebook and, and Twitter. But you mentioned LinkedIn yeah. um, a little while ago. And I'm sure lots of perhaps people, um, sort of listeners who are uh, use it on a professional basis probably know, you know, know, know what LinkedIn is. But um, there'll be lots of listeners who, who, who may not necessarily know what LinkedIn is and, and, and how it fits into that sort of media area. So I wonder if just very quickly you could say what it is and, and why you think it's useful for, for staff, students or anybody else to use. Yeah, sure. No, no problem at all, Carl. I mean, LinkedIn uh, underpins probably one of the, the things I am most passionate about in terms of what I would like to see students do whilst they're at university. From the moment that they start at university uh, to be at the sort of point of success when they leave, mm. they should be building a network, quite quite frankly. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it, I don't want it to be too clinical, but in some ways I've been in the game long enough now for, for me to actually stand back and think, yeah, actually, it's about recording every positive experience that you have or every positive interaction mm-hmm. that you have as you go through through university. Now, Carl, I know, uh, well, all of you are involved in, in e-portfolios and yep. so on and so forth, and, and I, know, I know that's been picked up in previous uh, podcasts, but um, uh, and, and that is a clearly a, a key part of this kind of reflecting and, and recording kind of process, and, and, I, and I, I seriously uh, kind of endorse and, and, and acknowledge that. Uh, what, what, what LinkedIn then does, I guess, is it, 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 it's, it's another tool by which people can can firstly record all of their uh, attributes and their their strengths and their um, professional um, kind of uh, competencies but also start to tell other people about them um, through building up uh, a network and um, uh, how they do that uh, you know I I will sit and do a lot of work with students these days uh, in terms of starting to sort of think right what sort of industries do you want to work in you can follow employers over a period of time you can start following employees over a period of time you could start maybe nudging one or two of those employees asking them about work experience mm-hmm. over a period of time you could start uh, having nudged them initially ask them about a specific uh, mm. thing that relates to a project that you're doing by the time you get to the, uni- the end of your university experience you may not just be nudging these people you may actually be either working for them 
uh, or possibly going for an interview with them and you are already in what I would call a kind of a warm lead environment which mm-hmm. is so so important when you mm-hmm. go for interviews mm-hmm. people know who you are they understand what your profile is um, and um, you know I, I do a lot of work with students on interview techniques and things and there is this kind of kind of x factor in an interview that you know for all the preparation you can do very little about and it is that kind of rapport that you need to have with those yes, people around yeah. you and if you set that up over two three four years whatever it happens to be linkedin allows you to do that mm. i'm probably going a bit off the point in terms of what linkedin is but it is essentially a place in which you can build uh, a network establish links with many other people in your profession and at the same time show them almost in, 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 uh, in simple terms, like through an online CV, but a, quite quite a detailed online CV as mm-hmm. to what it is you, you're doing. And of course, it allows you to keep updating and recording that in the same way as an, an e-portfolio uh, does. And I see the two things actually as being kind of um, quite, you know, that they dovetail quite nicely because you could do a certain amount of work within an e-portfolio and either, um, I, I guess you could link it to your LinkedIn account or you could mm-hmm. feed the information into your LinkedIn yep. account or you could have them run in parallel. Um, you know, that's something I'd be interested in exploring with you guys yeah, got, uh, a little bit further. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, again, I'm just looking it up here. Um, there was an article that came out um, on the 2nd of November on the BBC um, news page. And the title of it, uh, it says, Treat social media as a shop window for employees, but be careful. Mm. Um, again, I'll put a link up to the article underneath uh, this uh, this. Uh, podcast, but um, essentially what the article is saying is that increasingly modern organisations are putting a greater emphasis on the social networking presence of the candidates. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of goes on to say that although it shouldn't factor for much, there might be a, a, a scenario where uh, m- more followers on Twitter or more connections on LinkedIn is interpreted as a more positive thing that individual knows more about that mm-hmm. particular field of mm-hmm. employment so mm-hmm. it seems to be that um it's, it's more vital than ever really to kind of get yourself out there and make those connections but also manage it and, and just be aware that you it, it's almost it's a very deliberate attempt isn't it i guess to mm. create a professional profile mm. so it's a bit different mm. than going on facebook and putting pictures of your cat up it's like i know i'm going to have my private identity which i'll lock down maybe mm. with my friends and my family but mm. i'm going to create this persona think, if you like or is this a lovely feature at the moment as well which we've been discussing recently is um the endorsement part of it where On LinkedIn. yes yeah. where other professionals perhaps in your field um can endorse your skills mm. so that builds on your profile as well um and, and prospective employers can see that part of it oh yes they've got so many endorsements in this that and the other skill yeah. um and can see who's endorsed them as well so that's that's quite powerful it, it is powerful it, it, it's, I, I, on the, I have a little worry about that actually as as well though because i mean that that then is is um you know you can go around asking for lots of endorsements you, yep, and, you, and yep. kind of uh, <laughs> and, and the emails and, you and, go and, will you endorse yeah, me yeah. yeah um and um I, we're not on a level playing field now. We we're mm. on those people who are more proactive about asking for somebody to kind of kind of endorse yeah. them. I, I, it's interesting you mentioned that endorsement. What I do like about LinkedIn is you can certainly get kind of written references from yes, previous yeah. employers and things mm. like that. Mm-hmm. The endorsement of skills, I like it. I have to say, it's a nice feeling when somebody that you vaguely know has just kind of essentially said, "This guy's good at personal development." Sometimes I'm wondering how do they know? Because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But, um, so, so don't get me wrong. I, I mm. think I think it's a nice thing. It's it's interesting actually because uh, with with LinkedIn, I, I I saw the endorsements and. Um, uh, moving to a slightly critical point of view here as well. Um, th- there's this thing about um, work birthdays, which has suddenly appeared on LinkedIn uh, recently. Have you seen that? Or work, happy work Haven't anniversary. Seen that. So, oh, right. Um, because they obviously know what time you started yeah. your, your oh, current I position. See, right. And then 12 months in, they, 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 they sort of uh, ask everybody who's uh, your link to your network to wish you a happy work anniversary. Now, I have to say, this is a bit too <laughs> Facebooky for me. Yeah, you know, that's I, gone uh, a step too uh, far. Uh, yeah, I, I think, agree. Um, I agree. And, and I hope um, that LinkedIn. You know, catch on it's, to that. It's got its it's got its marketplace. It's a fantastic marketplace. Facebook's got obviously got its marketplace. It's a fantastic mm. marketplace. Twitter s- sits somewhere in 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 the middle. Uh, so that that's one point. One other thing, as you were talking there, Paul, about um, online profiles is this actually creates, as well as me being a very positive uh, ambassador for for the, for this, and, and see it as critical to the yeah. student experience. Uh, with every good thing, there has to come some health warnings. And uh, absolutely, you know, there's there's a couple of stories that I'm sure we've all seen online. Uh, mm. The famous one is at the Cisco Fatty, where somebody uh, was offered a job and then tweeted her about how uh, uh, could, were they going to trade in their ethical responsibilities for a big fat tr- trade set, uh, tra- tr- big fat paycheck working for Cisco. Uh, oh, or something right, like okay. That. So, um, I mean, that's an old one, but that's the one yeah. people often use as to say, "Whoa, yeah. bear in mind, there's the good side." Yeah. And it could be, you know, for, for, for any anything, you know, you could put 
20 good comments on, on mm. Twitter or Facebook or whatever it wants to be. And then it's only going to take one slip. Absolutely. One, one poor, not thinking things through mm. comment that uh, could ruin all no, of your No, you're quite right. Work, you're you know? quite right, yeah. yeah and, so, I, and I think that's actually a really good point, yeah. especially for, for students who are listening who perhaps are, are used to the, the Facebook way of doing mm. things. And it, it's worth mentioning that when you move on to something like LinkedIn, you do have to treat it as a as a professional media area. It's not the sort of place you can talk about your holiday in Ibiza and no. all the crazy stuff you've no. got up to. There's a place and a time for that, and and LinkedIn very much is a a very different beast altogether. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. There's um just as an aside, there's a there's a new website that's popped up called Adjust Your Privacy, and what that lets you do from one web page, it takes you to all the privacy settings of all the various social media accounts. Mm-hmm. So you can you can lock them down if you want to. Um, however, that's still not an excuse to be putting up stuff that's nope. going to land you in hot water. But mm-hmm. we mentioned last week on the podcast that we'd set up this Facebook page for all of the first years that were coming in. And uh, one of the things we were at great lengths to do on that one was actually put links up for all those first years saying, yes, we are using Facebook and yes, it's a really great tool, but please be aware that this is how you change your privacy settings. And please be aware that you are accountable for anything you put up there. Mm, mm. Um, so, yeah, these tools are fantastic, but there there has to be a level of education that goes on in and around using mm-hmm. them yeah. to make sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot, essentially, I guess, is the... And that's, to me, I think, uh, from, my, from where my service needs, needs to move forward with this is is actually, it creates a, a, a lot of... A, a new, our new work is based around this. It's about kind of... Um, picking up on how to use uh, the, the the LinkedIn profile most effectively and that might involve kind of uh, uh, kind of asking for endorsements and so on and so mm-hmm. forth it also uh, involves the the, the the health warnings and mm-hmm. um, clearly underpinning all of that it involves the fact that we want them to use these things because social media isn't just about um, you know I, I, it, it's it's a it's a kind of organic thing right yeah and, and, exactly and it's not uh, it, it's not you come to the session on social media you set up your LinkedIn profile you walk away you walk away I walked away from the mic you walk, <laughs> you walk away and, and and hope for for the job offers to come flooding in mm. you have to keep feeding that's uh, right feeding that. yeah mm. keep it up to date so we've kind of we've kind of Almost by happy coincidence, we've kind of moved on to the next kind of area, which is, you know, the, the technologies that students can use mm. uh, to enhance their employment opportunities. So we've got social media. Are there any other things? I mean, we've touched on e-portfolios. One of the kind of things that comes out from the research is that the trouble with e-portfolios, if you like, is if, if you ask several different people what they are, everyone's got their own opinion. Mm-hmm. But everyone seems to be in agreement that no matter what you use your e-portfolio for, be it assessing people's work or be it developing effective practice, there has to come a point when they graduate when that e-portfolio has the ability to be flipped mm-hmm. and becomes that tool, mm-hmm. uh, f- that, that shop window, if you like, mm-hmm. saying these are the skills that I've got. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just wondering, are there, are there any particular um, practices you'd recommend that students kind of invest in if they're looking to do an e-portfolio? Is there anything in particular that springs to mind the first key part of any e-portfolio is is in my view is is something that needs to be conducted offline and that is a real kind of self-awareness type of uh, type type of exercise now mm-hmm. as i say offline there are online tools in which you sure. can you can undertake psychometric tests and so forth mm-hmm. what i think is sometimes the danger with any of these things where you send someone off to self-reflect mm-hmm. um is they haven't got that sort of that human being to bounce ideas off yeah. and um, whilst i am i am very kind of keen on, on embracing technology in every way in which I can. Mm-hmm. There are one or two areas that I think um, for a human being to develop, you can, you, they can do a test, they can get a series of answers, but how they interpret those answers and how they interpret them in relation to the real world sometimes needs uh, a, a middleman or sure. to, yeah. to do so. Absolutely. So, so I think um, that, that that's a, a key part. Don't see an e-portfolio, and not just an e-portfolio, a LinkedIn to a profile, a, C- a CV, online, offline, mm. uh, whatever. Don't see it as just something that you just tick boxes and fill things in on. Mm. See it as the opportunity to actually get, you know, work out who you are first, mm. what employers are looking for secondly, and then start using language that is appropriate to that rather than uh, jargon or, or tick boxes. And, and so, sure. so that's my, that's my health warning in yeah. relation. Well, in relation to any of the things we've, we've just been yeah. discussing. And I guess that's where the role of the, you know, your your careers advisors come in, so. because it's like if if you want to speak to someone, well then those are the people 
uh, that you go and speak to, and they'll give you that help, support, and advice, guidance, and all that. All that Absolutely, kind of... and, and you know, as well as careers advisors, you know, employers, um, you know, there, there there are a lot of people you can get you can get information from uh, and, and bounce ideas from, and that, and that process I think is is quite important. Mm. Moving further down the line, though, um, having uh, any portfolio, and having sort of spoken to Carl about uh, some of the work he's done with more creative students, yeah, uh, and and effectively the development of a website is what is what we're talking about yeah, yeah. i think is absolutely fantastic because over the last sort of four five six years i've been working uh, doing career sessions with um your, your filmmakers your animators your design students and so forth mm-hmm. and we, we talk about a portfolio and 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 more and more now it's yeah but you know you can tuck it all in a box somewhere but how is an employer ever gonna gonna see that and how you can kind of include your work uh, as part of uh, some sort of website is is critical now and mm. uh, when you're making those initial contacts to employers then uh, you know that visual impact of them being able to see your work straight away is mm. is, yeah. is critical mm. and uh, you know up until a year or two ago i was encouraging them to say you do know how to build a website don't you know and i have i have no idea but assuming that they do these, these tools um I, I guess allow those who haven't got those kind of web design skills to at least be able to put something out there that shows their work yeah, yeah absolutely and it, 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 as, as you said it, it's a great way to allow them to kind of express themselves um above and beyond carrying a big paper chunky paper portfolio around with them which is you know, nigh on impossible for, for most students. So it's a great way to allow them to express and showcase what they do uh, and and um, allow them to kind of build up a bank of their work whilst they're here as a student, but also something they can take away to potential employers and, and, and really use it as a way to kind of showcase the good stuff that, they, that they've been doing over however many years they've been a student with us and beyond that point. Mm. Um, and actually, just as a kind of as an aside here, for those who listen to um, the last couple of podcasts, I can't remember if it was episode maybe one or two, um, we did very briefly touch on e-portfolios, and I mentioned the Careers and Employability Service in, in those, and mm. we'd gone in and actually um, run some sessions or some kind of theory-based sessions on e-portfolios with part-time and full-time engineering students, um, and they were a completely different kettle of fish altogether compared to the, um, the photography yeah. and art students, yeah. but I think they could see the ideas and the concepts and the reasons why you'd use an e-portfolio and what the, what the valuable um, aspects of that would be so it it you know it, it does work with a number of students in a number of areas but you have to tailor how they would use that e-portfolio to specifically mm. meet the needs and criterias of that group mm. that would be using it at any mm. particular time i mean just to uh, jump in what it, we're saying about e-portfolios if someone's listening to this and thinking oh i want to get i want to make an e-portfolio what tools have you, have you been using with those students to to build those e-portfolios? Well, well, um, and again, I think I think we very briefly touched on this in, in a previous um, podcast, mm-hmm. but but specifically, we've been using Google Sites uh, as our e-portfolio creation area, and we, we call it an e-portfolio. But essentially, it's it's Google Sites, and as the name suggests, it it allows you to create a website. We use that website creation tool to to kind of. Um, steer it towards becoming an e-portfolio as opposed to just a, a kind of this is my website, this is my cat and yeah. here's a video of my cat. Yeah. Um, we try and tailor it so that it allows students to to kind of, yes, they can add videos about um, the work they're doing. Yes, they can upload Word documents, photographs, Excel spreadsheets, audio files, whatever it might be, but to kind of tailor their website portfolio into something that's valuable and useful um, and is it, it allows them to to reflect on the work they're doing as they're undertaking it but as Paul said earlier, kind of flip it once they've left education and actually use that as a, a self-promotional tool that they could take out into industry. Um, and again, it depends what industry they're working in. It might not work in all industries, but it would allow certainly um, a, a good proportion of students to use the, the, the um, work that they're showcasing as, as, a, as a tool to um, take out to potential employers. Yeah. We'll, we'll put a link to a guide up if you want to get started in using Google Sites. I mean, the, the thing to emphasize with it is that it doesn't belong to a university. No. So it means that the the portfolio or, or whatever it is that, that individual creates is theirs for as long as they want mm. it. Because that's traditionally been one of the, the major stumbling blocks. Um, a lot of the work that was done kind of um, at the turn of this century, um, the research went into it, saw a lot of universities developing their own bespoke systems, which were great and lovely. And they met the strategic needs that the university had but then once that student graduated, if the question was, what, what happens? And some stu- some universities will turn around to a student and go, well, you need to pay us mm-hmm. an ongoing annual fee to maintain that. Mm-hmm. Or some students, I mean, we had students coming in this year when we did our, we did the IT inductions for all of the students that came in this year. 
And we had students coming in from other universities, and I'm not going to name any names, but they said they'd done an e-portfolio, but it was locked up at yeah. this other university yeah. and their login had expired and they couldn't get their work out. And it's like, well, that's not really, I mean, it, it's great because it helps that institution, but it doesn't necessarily help that individual because their career is going to last a lot longer than their time at university, which might be three years yeah. compared to 30, 40, 50 years working. Well, yeah. like Lloyd said, it's, it's organic and it grows with them. Mm. So absolutely, and giving I mean, them ownership I, yeah. of it means they can take it with them. For the rest of their lives basically yeah, absolutely Lindsay spot on there and I, and I think the key point to make is that uh, you know yes okay they may still have all the original documents that they've been uploading to their e-portfolio but it's the kind of sweat blood and tears they put into yeah. creating the thing that they lose out on when it's kind of when it's mm. taken away from them yeah. so it's it's not the fact that that they had a portfolio of, of stuff and now it's gone it's the effort that they put into creating it and tailoring it into something mm. that resembles them essentially and I suppose you can to go back to what we first talked about, you would have worked with the blogs. You could say, well, my e-portfolio contains the evidence or the artifacts, if you like, of, of what I've been doing. And I've got, I'm on LinkedIn. I've got my, my profiles to connect with individuals. But you might also then have a blog which gives the narrative mm -hmm. behind those artifacts, mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, almost like a director's commentary on a DVD explaining why they've done this particular piece of work or how they found it or what skills they learn and what you know it's that kind of insight into a, a person's kind of professional working that you wouldn't necessarily get if they didn't have that kind of setup because you've got a cv which is oh you can you, you've, you've got mm. these things but you don't necessarily get the insight into well you know what did you learn how did you learn why did you learn it you yeah. know, where do you want to go from here yeah absolutely please hang up and try again so um, we've talked about, uh, obviously, how you use technology within your department at the moment and the kind of technologies that students might use to enhance their kind of career prospects. Looking forward, are there any technologies uh, that you're kind of investing in now uh, that you'll be using in, say, in 12, 18, 24 months' time? Yeah, I think there's a few that we, we're just starting to sort of play around with and see some potential with. I mean, I mentioned video CVs earlier, and that's mm -hmm. a sort of work in progress. Um, we're also looking at um, how we can use Skype more effectively right. in terms of the service. Now, there's kind of two angles to this. Uh, there's the how we can engage with students via Skype, mm -hmm. uh, obviously with the university here have been split across two campuses, and who knows, there may be more campuses soon. Indeed. Uh, we, we, <laughs> we, uh, we, we, we may want to communicate uh, effectively with, uh, with different people. And indeed, even at the moment, we, we work with students up in the Community University of the Valleys, and mm -hmm. uh, we haven't been able to persuade them to use Skype yet, and there's probably some work to do there. Okay. But, you know, that's, that's one element. Mm -hmm. Also, been a using Skype and facilitating students using Skype to engage with employers is, uh, I think, going to be a growth area. Right. I know other career services have been looking at this mm -hmm. uh, because career services have always historically been in that kind of bridge between mm. uh, the, the, the inside life of university and, and the outside mm -hmm. world. And uh, Skype, and, and indeed the way the labour market is now, you know, it's a global labour market. It's not just sort of an employer down the end of your street anymore, yeah. if indeed it ever was. So uh, we, we've had a couple of examples where students have come in and... Um, for example, I think that one was trying for a, a TEFL uh, position in, in Thailand or China. Right, or okay. Like that. And I think they, they were um, they used Skype to talk to the school uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to set up that particular position. Okay. TEFL is teaching English as a foreign language gotcha. and going abroad uh, to, to, to do that. Wow. Uh, I, I would envisage that many uh, recruiters uh, will, will use Skype more and more as part of their... Mm. Um, uh, kind of maybe either their initial sort of screening or kind of first or second stage interviews. Yeah. Skype may may take over from telephone interviews, which I think has always been the the traditional mm, yeah. thing because it just may give them a little bit more. I've used Skype, in fact, to um, recruit a member to my team um, 12, 18 months ago on something called the Leonardo scheme, which is a scheme that allows you know, we could, either students this in this country, or sorry, graduates in this country, to mm -hmm. go and, and work abroad in uh, across Europe. Right. Uh, in this particular case, it was a graduate from another country who wanted to come and experience mm -hmm. a, a career service over here, a uh, chap from Spain. And so I uh, had the first initial conversations with him via, via Skype. So I think Skype's a, 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 there's a potential there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah sure. absolutely. Um, where else? I've got a couple of other things. I mean, using apps, mobile apps, okay. is, is another thing that we, 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 again, just played a little bit around mm -hmm. with. There is a, a Newport Careers app. It's okay. part of the Newport Uni app. There is, yeah. It's yeah. part of it. And again, we'll put a link up to that as well. Fantastic. But yes, Dan, that's on Android and iOS devices. So you can, you know, your smartphone of choice, you can you can get it if you want to. Good to know. <laughs> Good to know. Um, and um, yeah, at the moment, that is a, essentially a job advertising, advertising site. Uh, 
one of the many features that I haven't mentioned today of the career services mm. we do through our engagement with employers have opportunities, work placements, work experience, uh, full time jobs, part time jobs, and um, uh, we do promote them both via our website, mm -hmm. which was one of the tools I didn't mention earlier with the website, mm -hmm. but also we use the phone application oh, for brilliant. students to look at that. Um, one other area of our work in terms of uh, providing information interactively, mm -hmm. I think there may be maybe future pro possibilities here. At the moment, we've sort of we, we provide a lot of information online. You know, I want to be a um, you know a, an artist or something like that, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, two or three kind of pages of information on uh, on on the. On, the, on that career, what you need to get into it, who the local connections are and so forth. Now, gotcha. if we can present that in a in a more kind of fluid way, uh, maybe through an e-zine or something, mm -hmm. something along those lines, yeah. uh, we, we, we would want to do more of that. We do have one, I don't know if we can call it an e-zine or not, I'm going to call it an e-zine anyway. E-zine um, it's it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, our, our, our introductory guide to finding a part-time job around Newport and you can, right. can access that via our website as well and that is one of those kind of click each page and they and it turns, turns oh, and, well, lovely, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, Funny enough, I'm also working on an on an e-zine outside of the university with um, a professional body, the careers professional body called AGCAS and mm -hmm. uh, Association of Graduate Careers Advisory Services. Right. And they produce a journal for all of the universities across the UK, which uh, due to cost uh, reasons, but also I think technological reasons, the uh, transfer of that being a hard copy mm -hmm. into an e-zine is, is, is becoming uh, uh, the next step. And we've been looking at various different types of software that support right. that to make it as user friendly as possible. Mm -hmm. So I see that as, um, again, you're talking 12, 18 months, maybe a little bit longer, but I think that kind of uh, how we, you know, it's not just about presenting web pages anymore, but mm, it's about presenting yeah. information in a more a more accessible way. Can yeah. I just ask, for those who may not know, what an e-zine is? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. is, is it a generic term? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, uh, I mean, essentially, what it is, it's, it's, you take a PDF, so you make, you make a document in, say, Microsoft Word or Publisher or whatever it is, you know, whatever you want to use. You can then save it as a PDF file. Um, you can then upload it to. Um, there are a number of links. We'll put. We'll, we will put a link to a page which has a number of links off to these services. But essentially, there are lots of different websites that will take this PDF that you've got and turn it into almost like an animated flip book, oh, which nice. appears on the page. So that's what you're talking about, yeah. Lloyd. Yeah. And yeah, then that. people can print it if they want to, but they can read it on the page. But the nice thing is, unlike a normal static document where mm. you have to scroll down page one, page two, page three. You click on the corner and the page actually animates flipping over. Oh, I like the sound so of that. It's, um, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, some people call it uh, electronic publishing. Some people call it digital publishing. Some people call it e-zines. It's, yeah. it's all that. It, it's basically about getting uh, your printed media online but making it feel like it's printed. Like it's printed. Yeah, I like that a lot. So, mm. you know. And some of these services let you do create these things, but embed live, embed videos in yeah, them as well, which yeah. is quite cool. So we'll we'll, we'll put links up to mm -hmm. that if people want to have a go. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a very nice way of kind of bridging that gap between people who have the printed hard copy, which they feel quite safe with, and making that leap to to using things digitally. It's like, well, this is a kind of halfway house medium because it feels like you're reading a piece of, you know, a printed piece of paper or a printed journal when actually, you know, it's just on the screen. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can then share that information going back to social Absolutely. media and all the rest of it as well. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's 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 got to be again thinking ahead. That's the sort of thing that we'd we'd, we'd be looking to do. Brilliant. Okay, well, um, I, th I think it's time to to wrap the podcast up now, and I want to thank um, Lloyd for coming along. It's been a really, really useful and interesting session, and mm. I, I hope the listeners out there have, have got a lot of useful information from it. Um, I'll make my way round the room and just kind of uh, let everyone say their goodbyes, and, uh, and thanks very much for, for listening. Um, Paul, thank you very much for, for being here yet again. And, it's been um, a pleasure. And, uh, I, you know, looking forward to hearing more information about your Welsh Assembly government, George, <laughs> very, very soon. Um, uh, thank you very much to Lindsay for coming along and standing in for us yet again. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, and I'm Massive thank you to Lloyd, as I said, for coming along and uh, and sharing his, his experiences and knowledge with us. Oh, it's been great to be here. And I mean, you know, uh, I'm very passionate about technology and uh, to the point where um, my six-year-old daughter did her first tweet last night. So, did uh, she? I Fabulous. Thought, uh, I thought, you know, <laughs> oh, love her. I, I, practice, I practice what I preach. Now you're looking from an early age. <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so all that remains is for me to say uh, one final thank you to all of you out there listening. And hopefully we'll catch you again very, very soon on the next podcast. Thank you.